thanks. Great to be here. These are some of the folks who've helped put this talk together. I've talked about whales. I've talked about whaling. I haven't talked about Newburyport, so I put the call out, and I want to thank everybody who's made this possible. And we've got some show and tell, because as we went into the attic and we looked around, we were able to pull a lot of items out. And then we're going to have a big reveal somewhere through here that I think some of you are going to be pretty excited about. Jeff, uh, who couldn't join us today, uh, is a little under the weather. This is his frontispiece from his Among the Whale book, which is a really terrific read. It's a fast read. It's a fun read. And you'll see throughout the course of the talk today, a lot of the places that the Merrimack went will be highlighted. This is a great drawing, I think, and it just captures so much of the whaling voyage with this light behind me and uh, the bark in the background. When we think about the first time you've heard of whales, not only does it go back millennia, it's written into the Bible. Here's Jonah being spit out by the whale, but you see this in popular culture. Man has got dominion over the birds and the beasts, and you see this reflected throughout Moby Dick. A brief history of whaling. What you're looking at here, think about whaling uh, very early on. People have obviously been whaling for a long time, rendering oil as uh, goes back to Babylonian times, clay vessels, and they clearly had whale oil to, to light, and also uh, Japanese whaling, which goes back uh, thousands of years. The Basques started whaling fairly aggressively in about uh, the 1500s or so, and I'll show you a map of the world, Map of Monday, uh, where they're off the coast of Newfoundland. You'll hear me using the term Yankee whaling. Uh, before the Yankees got involved, Britain, France, Dutch were actively whaling in the uh, North Atlantic. Yankees really created a strategic differentiating factor, which I'll talk about, which petered out sometimes after Titusville. This is the discovery of oil, civil war, and a number of other factors. So we didn't have to kill whales because we didn't need the baleen. By the way, baleen. Uh, Bill, could you pick up the baleen? Uh, can I have you pick things up? This is baleen, and it was used for corsets. <laughs> uh, you're all set. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. <laughs> These are all up here to, to look at. Uh, I'll explain. I watermarked my career. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's he's going to spin the slide now. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the 20th century really is uh, uh, a decimation of whales in terms of population uh, extinction uh, to uh, an extent which is remarkable. Now, when we're talking about whales in the 18th and 19th century, we're talking about the right whale, we're talking about the sperm whale, and we're talking to some extent the very acrobatic uh, humpback whale. We're not talking about the finback and we're not talking about the blue whale. Any ideas why we're not talking about finback and blue? They're too fast. How, how fast can you row a rowboat? These guys are the greyhounds of the sea. I mean, these things, they just outrun you. Not only that, if you kill them, they actually sank. Well, not much good killing a whale if it sinks, right? So the specific gravity of these whales, because they had so much blubber on them, was such that they were perfect whales to hunt. The North Atlantic right whale, which comes off just the coast of, is highly endangered. They'll be coming up right around now. They're breeding down in Florida sometime in February and March. They'll, they'll come off the coast here. And there's about three to 400 of these left. Uh, but there are South Atlantic right whales, and then there's North and South Pacific right whales. Uh, we'll be talking mostly about right whales and sperm whales through this. So here's a sperm whale. You can tell the sperm whale by its spout. Also, in this cavity here, this is uh, where there is spermaceti. You have the flukes. You can always tell a whale because its flukes are horizontal instead of fish, which are vertical. If you look at this uh, quip, Yankees dominated the whaling industry throughout the 18th and 19th century, boldly departing on thousands of voyages, crewed by tens of thousands of men, hunted hundreds of thousands of whales, and rendered tens of millions of gallons of oil. And the only thing missing there is how much money did they make, but you just need to look at mansions in Nantucket and New Bedford and here, and you can uh, see that this is obviously a very profitable business if you're able to retire at the age of 30 or 35 and have a mansion like that. Here is a fact on the amount of sterling which came into the colonies just before the Revolutionary War, where it accounted for 53% of sterling coming in, uh, which is quite dramatic. Newburyport is 
in this span of time between 1804 and 1876. This chart shows there are three whaling capitals in America uh, over a time from early on through really the end of Yankee whaling, age of sail. Uh, the first is, no surprise, in Nantucket. Uh, the second period is uh, the golden period in New Bedford. And the third is with the transcontinental railroad, why would you hunt whale in the Arctic and go around the horn to bring it back to New Bedford when you can come into San Francisco and you can ship it across in the railroad? There are very few log books in Nantucket and New Bedford and the various places uh, to talk about this period. It does bump up a couple of key points uh, here, American Revolution, war is never good for business. Uh, boats have to stay in port, happened here, happened elsewhere. Whalers are reaching Hawaii, so we're seeing global pursuit uh, as early as the 20s. You see that with the Essex, obviously. Uh, there's the gold rush, uh, many of the vessels here bringing people there. You have the discovery of rock oil, which is essentially petroleum. Hey, guess who was able to uh, distill the rock oil coming out of the ground? It was the refiners, it was the whale refiners who said, hmm, maybe it's time to move our business strategy away from whaling. Do you double down? Do you get out of the business? Or do you change your business strategy and go down to Pennsylvania? And many of them did that. The discovery of spring steel and later plastic uh, was one of the reasons why whaling decreased, because by then there was no need to hunt whale for oil. You were hunting it for baleen, which was a pliable plastic-like material. Well, that was more cheaply produced by steel. And then it really peters out when the Norwegians get into the market, and then we get into 20th century whaling. Here's a snapshot uh, just to give you an idea of magnitude. We know that there are about 17,000 whaling voyages over a 200-year period. Uh, we know that because there's a great database uh, called whalingvoyages.org. Moon contributed to that back in the day, some great stuff in there. There are 58 vessels built in Newbury, Newbury Port, and they went on 464 whaling cruises, 11 vessels from Salisbury. 17 vessels built in Amesbury. What's the most famous vessel from Amesbury pertaining to whaling? There you go. And then um, in Haverhill. The first is this unknown vessel in 1784, the Minerva. See the name George Pollard? What was the name of the captain of the Essex? George Pollard Jr. At the Merrimack, that's what this book is all about. She sailed out of here a couple of times, three times, and then she went down to New London as our port. Uh, but this is the first vessel. That was John Pease. And you can see the size. It gets up to... Uh, 414 tons. That's like uh, the Charles Morgan, uh, just to give you an idea, the Charles Morgan down in Mystic. Now, the lifeboat is really cool. I put this in because this is, I love this, uh, this is the crew list from the life space boat. It's a schooner and it's a whaler at a Newbury port. And you can see exactly who went on it. And it's signed by the deputy uh, director of the customs house. Pretty cool. And then the last is the Georgia, which is one of the last vessels to leave. And I'm not the person to talk about this because this is totally Bethany's domain because there's your man, Ebony Bradbury. So thank you for bringing him to my attention. And there's a logbook of that down at, in New Bedford. And now by comparison, if you look at large vessels built here, you're looking at about 250, give or take, uh, large vessels, including clippers built in Newburyport. So it's not insignificant. It does show high degree of productivity. It shows strategic depth. Uh, and you can see that if you're counting up 100 vessels between Salisbury, Amesbury, and Newbury, Newburyport, that's not insignificant compared to 250. So that's the thesis of my talk. Now this, <coughs> which is again online, shows a couple of things. Oil and bone. This is sperm oil. Uh, this is the magnitude of sperm oil which is collected. I pick, this goes on a scale. The scale rolls up and down. I stopped at 1837, which is around the time of the Merrimack uh, coming back in. And you can see that 6,300 barrels was landed or sent home and that was valued at just over three and a half million dollars. There is uh, a folder to my right and Kerry Poirier put this together 
And you can see repeated notations in here encouraging people to get into the whaling business because there was a lot of money to be had and stories related to that. Let's go back to start of whaling in the North Atlantic in a serious way. This is this Mapamundi, 1546, and it shows a coin. This coin, if you, you can see this at the Whaling Museum in um, San Sebastian. You can tell they're hunting right whale. You see this here? And you see the spout. So a sperm whale, it goes forward, but this has got two blowholes, so you can always tell a right whale because of that. This is a uh, late 17th century. This is Abraham Stork. It's just about as grisly as it comes. You've got a, a wreck over here. They've got a whale here, which they brought alongside. They would put waifs, W-A-I-F, waifs in the whales. This was property. They would float. And the color on the flag of the waif would correspond, so there should be a red flag on a red waif. They also try to fill their holes, not just with whale oil, but they'll get a jump on the season by hunting polar bear, walrus, seal. So they can sometimes fill a quarter of their hold uh, before they get going. The big difference, though, is that the whale was flensed in blanket pieces. They would pull these strips up. They would put them in caskets, either bring them back to where they came from, England or Holland, or they would render them on shore. And the big difference with Yankee whaling is they decided it'd be a really great idea to put flammable oil on top of, which is uh, on, on an oil-stained deck in the middle of the ocean. And believe it or not, there are no records of whaling vessels being set ablaze, <laughs> the, 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 which is, uh, or at least intentionally. <laughs> uh, this is John Ward, bucolic scene. It looks like a painting that Constable would paint, right? It's very serene, it's almost bucolic. They're out for a little day in the woods. And these poor unfortunate creatures, the norwals, uh, the, the, the sea lion, the seals here, uh, you see the, uh, the walruses rather, two walrus tusks there, they're all about to get killed, which is very sad. And uh, here you can see another shot of it. Here is the blanket piece. Because the whales were buoyant, you know when you peel an apple, you know the machine that peels the apple and it goes around and around? You turn the whale around, it's buoyant, so it rotates, and that's how you're able to pull up basically a strip of bacon. It's bacon, essentially, that you're putting into a big cauldron, and what do you do with the bacon fat? You pour it off, you let it cool, it goes into the hold. This is whaling beginning in the US. This is uh, 1640, and it started on Long Island, not surprisingly, just like all over the world, a whale would wash ashore and it became property. And as a result of this, laws were written around who owns the property, who owns the whale, and it got quite litigious. This is a fascinating map written by Benjamin Franklin and one of the Folgers, 1768, and it's the first documentation of the Gulf Stream. And the reason why Franklin and Folger knew about this stream is because where would the whales eat? And it's right where the waters are turbulent in the ocean, and that described this Gulf Stream. Interestingly enough, when Franklin went to England in his diplomatic pursuits, he brought this map with him, and the Royal Navy dismissed it. How could a farmer from the colonies possibly tell the Royal Navy what to do? So then Franklin went to France, this map is in French. The French sent spies to England to buy up all the maps that were given the Brits. And this was essentially intellectual property that they used for trade. OK, here's a cool story. Boston Tea Party, right? In 1760, John Hancock inherits a bunch of cash from his uncle, uh, who dies. A very wealthy man. John Hancock became very wealthy. So he thought it would be a good idea to try to corner the whale oil market. And so he went head to head with the Roach family. Well, it didn't work out very well for John Hancock. Hancock's point was, look, I've got all these trading, I speak English, I have my contacts in England, I've got trading vessels and merchant vessels, so all I need to do is uh, corner the, the, the head matter market, the oil market, uh, and then I'm gonna be able to control this. Well, the Roaches didn't like that. They had whaling vessels, 
well, they could also speak English, and they could easily convert their whalers into uh, transport vessels. As a matter of fact, it's one of the reasons why so many of the vessels built here were converted into whalers at some point in their life. It was a relatively easy thing to do. And so he lost a lot of money. He lost his fortune. So cycle forward to that fateful day, the town meeting in Feniel Hall. Huh, kind of interesting that it was the Dartmouth that was owned by the roaches that just happened to come in with a whole pile of tea. And I'd imagine that probably Hancock felt pretty good that he could get one back in those roaches in Nantucket. <laughs> I'm just speculating. Uh, so why hunt whales? Not a fun pursuit at all. Never was a fun pursuit. So according to the BBC, King Charles, when he was crowned and he had this chrism oil put on his forehead, uh, it was animal cruelty free. But before that, sovereigns from around the world would have part of this. Now this lump of stuff is uh, kind of interesting to put on your forehead because when a whale, a sperm whale, eats squid, the particles get stuck in its, it's in its gut and it forms something called ambergris. It was used as a fixative, and believe it or not, there are tons of ambergris in some of the vaults in France today where they make some fine perfumes, uh, but King Charles didn't use it. Of course, I couldn't talk about England without talking about Ireland. This is St. Brendan. He supposedly goes across the ocean, and where does he say mass? On the top of a whale. So that is one of the things that you're trying to get from a whale, if you find in the spelly of a sperm whale, ambergris, your voyage is made. Forget about all the oil, you're gonna make millions of dollars. Now the next reason is oil to keep you safe. With the industrial revolution booming, how do you keep the lights going? How do you send the guys down to coal mines? How do you keep workers working uh, past sundown and before sunup. Well, guess what? It's with, it's with whale oil, which is, which is brought in, which is kind of crazy to think that a kid could hop in a vessel made in Amesbury, gets on board in the port in Newburyport, goes around the Horn, goes into the Pacific, visits Hawaii, kills a couple of sperm whales, brings that back here, it gets rendered all to be transported over to England so that it can go into a light, right? That's, that's global business. Uh, now, starting uh, before the revolution, this is Timothy Daxter. Don Roberts sent me this yesterday. I just had to put her in. Uh, apparently, this guy, he tries to monopolize. Uh, it's called whale bone, but it's baleen. It's what Bill was showing you. And this is so pliable that it made corsets. But apparently, he made uh, a lot of money from buying all the baleen in, uh, in Boston. Now, we've got Plum Island Lighthouse. Who would you guess is one of the largest government purchasers of whale oil and sperm oil in the country? Uh, lighthouse service, right? Because you need to have clear, bright light, and in wintertime like this, it's not gelling up, and in the summertime, it, uh, it, it's also reliable. Uh, so they were one of the largest purchasers. I need Vanna White to the stage again. That's you, Bill. <laughs> yeah, right under the, you got to do the big unveil. I've been carrying this, everybody in my family, mm -hmm. I've been carrying this around my mm -hmm. whole life. Mm -hmm. And when I brought it down to mm -hmm. James, he's the first person mm -hmm. that knew what it was and appreciated it. So this has been my family along with that sperm whale tooth for a hundred, about well, probably 130 years. And it actually says sperm oil on it and a price per gallon. So when I showed it mm -hmm. to James, mm -hmm. he actually had a... <laughs> <laughs> so if you look in that, one of my kids probably 40 years ago put a trick-or-treat candy in it. We've been researching this, and this is from New Report, <laughs> along with that sperm, sperm whale tooth. Ta-da! So these, mm -hmm. both of these items have been together in my family. I'm fourth generation new reporter that grew up on the waterfront. My father had a fishing boat down Plum Island. As far as we know, it's probably... Oh, that's, uh, it's got to be probably 1860s thereabouts. Put it back to the whale oil mm -hmm. that may have been in the lighthouses around here. So. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> Thanks, Bill, for Thanks that. It's great. <laughs> it's great. It's great. I have, I've not seen one of these, and I've been in the game 15 years in the whaling game, and I love it that it ties to the lighthouse, right? So it makes it very, and so come up and smell it. It smells like linseed, it likes to, 
it smells like linseed oil, just to give you a hint. <laughs> okay, we're on the Ys. We're on the Ys for whaling. So here's a Y. So the lights, when you measure a light, right, it's a lumen. Where do they come up with feet and measurements and pounds and stone? Where do they come up with lumen? Lumen is 120 grams of spermaceti uh, wax, which is from whaling. Benjamin Franklin, of course, he had a vested interest in all of this, right, because he's related to the Folgers. You'll see here, instead of uh, cursing the darkness, uh, light a candle, and then there's this little plug that he sends a guy. Uh, so it, these candles, they didn't drip. They were very bright light. They were perfect for the lighthouses, right, particularly with the Fresnel lens. And it's not an oil. So in the head of the sperm whale, that spermaceti is chemically different from the rendered blubber, which is oil. And when it was compressed, it was a Sephardic Portuguese Jew who figured out in Newport how to compress this stuff to eventually get the wax. And that was, that was the real gold. Why did Yankees dominate a global pursuit? They invented a technique to separate the head matter as early as 1750, and it was the first monopoly in the colonies. Uh, try works on board, we talked about that, right, where you put these cauldron on board and light a fire, great idea. Whale boats, a sim simple thing like a dory, but just modifying it so that you could get out of Dodge as quickly as you went in, because when you're going on a whale, on a whale boat, and you hit it with a lance, it might be a good idea to get out of there quickly. Uh, so that was a pretty good invention. And then the lay system was an incentive, and it's really what differentiated Yankee whaling from England or France. And it's simply this, if you uh, have a crew that know they're going to get a, you know, a couple of pennies, whether it's good weather or bad weather, well, maybe when the bad weather comes, they don't go out in their whale boats when they see the whales, right? But if you're incentivized by every whale you kill, you're going out in all sorts of conditions. So simple, just capitalism at work. And then the Temple Toggle Harpoon, uh, his name was Lewis Temple, black guy came up from Virginia. So he escaped slavery and uh, he was a blacksmith. I went to New Bedford, uh, he invented this device. Now they've been hunting whales for thousands of years, right? So like you gotta build a better mousetrap. All the harpoons, and if you look at shapes of harpoons, they've got all sorts of funky heads with barbs and all the rest. The trouble is they go in, but they pull out easily. And so you've gone to all that effort you may have been out there for months and not seen a whale. You finally get a whale, you stick it with a harpoon, and the thing pulls out. Well, you're gonna be a little annoyed. So what he decided was, what if I put a little piece of wood in here and it pivots around this point, so when it goes into the whale, this wood breaks and this becomes a T. And now, that doesn't come out as much. And this simple device, that simple trick, absolutely revolutionized the game because the capture rate went way up as a result of it. He didn't copyright this and he died a pauper. <laughs> but great story, right? And it, it, it goes to show um, African Americans in the, in, in, in the trade. So this is the press. This is on Nantucket. This is from the spermaceti that's in the head of the sperm whale. And it goes into these bags and then over a process of cooling in the winter and summer, this gets pressed and cooled and pressed and heated and pressed. And over a period of time, in this goes to a barrel underneath here, and that's where you're getting, you're draining off your oil. And then what's left in the bag is the crystallized wax. And it's from that wax that they're able to make the sperm whale. This is an example of the triworks. So you have cauldrons, which would be about this size, about four feet diameter, three feet diameter. You light them from below, and then you feed the whale oil in. And here's an example of the double-ended whaler, and he's about to harpoon the whale. This is Herman Melville signing up for a voyage. And there is Herman Melville's name right there. He's uh, signing on to the, uh, the Akushnet from Fairhaven, which is right next to Akushnet, and his lay was 165th, so he wouldn't get a lot of money, and because he never returned, he didn't get anything. Uh, but he did write a really good book. <laughs> 
I threw this in because it's one of the few pictures I could find of a vessel, a whaler from Newburyport. This is, you can see it's got New Bedford on it, but this is the Milo. This is a typical whaler in the mid 19th century. It's got a large hold. There's your triworks, and you'll notice the number of whaling boats on here. This model, which was up in the attic, is of the Cape Cory. It's not too much bigger than the Essex. Unlike the clipper ships, which had very few crew, these would have, well, there were 21 who actually started out in the Essex and went down to 20 before, well, they started to eat themselves. But a clipper ship would have much fewer crew. These would be heavily loaded up, and a vessel like this would probably have about 35 crew. Uh, so pretty large, and you can see this, they obviously want lots of whale boats because that's what they're going hunting on. So what do they do? This is up in the Arctic, uh, not a fun job. You're looking out, spotting a whale, there she blows. And then this is a clip from Heart of the Sea uh, movie with Chris Hemsworth in it. Had the pleasure of meeting him down in New York. It was pretty cool when they launched this. Uh, they were asking us for advice. <laughs> I said, your whale is a little big. <laughs> uh, uh, this, is a, this is a great print. They're going on a sperm whale. You can always tell a sperm whale because of this distinctive shape. Uh, you can see he's getting ready to put a harpoon in them. The difference between the lance and the harpoon. The harpoon, it's like in Jaws. You know when it shoots the barrel into the shark? You're not killing the shark. You're tiring the shark out. And the barrel is the boat. So your harpoon sticks in with the temple toggle harpoon, and then you go on the Nantucket sleigh ride. And you can imagine if you're a kid, you don't have a lot of money, so you don't own a horse. This is before you've been on a train. You've probably sledded down a hill and it's felt pretty good, but you're not being pulled ever at 20 knots by a sperm whale which is what these guys would have had happened. So they're flying, it must have been an exhilarating experience. There's a really good clip actually in Heart of the Sea. Here's another fantastic drawing by Jeff Briggs. Uh, this is a whale rising, sperm whale rising up. This is uh, Garner Ray, he's a French artist. He just gets a lot of action here. Uh, this is a sperm whale coming up and breaking the backbone in a whale ship, oh, a whaler rather. This is fascinating, this is a North Atlantic right, right, because it's got two flukes. The color print of this is actually fire in the chimney, they'd say, and it's a blood being squirted up. But look at the composition of the crew. Black, black, pretty interesting, I think. He's about to lance it, so the whale is tired, and he's trying to go for the vital organs in the whale, trying to get the lung and the heart to kill it, so it goes into a flurry. You can see the waif, there's that waif I was talking about earlier as they row a whale back. And here is the blanket piece being hoisted up with the um, triworks ablaze in the back. No OSHA regs back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine, this is, there's a later version, they, they improved on this, but the early versions, so the Essex, would have had a little stage like this. Now I presume there would have been a rope or something which ties you, but the whales would have been attracted to all the blood by the hundreds. As a matter of fact, so this is a sperm tooth which has just been hauled out of uh, the mandible from a sperm tooth. And you can see all the ridges in it. The one that Bill gave us is a polished tooth. So they would use their jackknives to polish this. Those sharks, they'll kill a shark. The, they use the shark skin as sandpaper. So this was smoothed down on the ocean, because you're not bringing sandpaper with you. Can't go to the hardware store. And you're using um, shark skin to sand it. What a crazy proposition to be doing this, rolling this whale over and over. And here are two shots. Somebody has to climb down, put a chain on here, and then you're hoisting up. This is a sperm whale because he's got teeth, right? It doesn't have baleen. They created this um, stage, this plank here where you walk out and you're cutting. They're out there cutting the blubber and then by block and tackle, they're pulling up these blanket pieces, swinging them over, and then some unlucky chap has got to go back down again, put a hole in the skin, they start cutting and they bring it up. 
This came in from Kerry just yesterday, and I thought this is just great research. So at the PBD Essex Museum Storage Center in Rowley, they have the Custom House records uh, from this period, and she's identified 270 sailors who are men of color, and you'll see it on the list over here because uh, it describes the complexion and the hair color of crew. So I would be no hair and fair skin, uh, uh, but it'll say skin dark, hair black, so you can infer. And specifically, it says somebody's from Cape Verde. But this is fascinating in the sense that we're now quantifying to some degree how many sailors of color sailed out of Newburyport. I think it's great research, and more work needs to be done on this. So I was just thinking through what the value chain is here. Uh, raw materials, abundance of oak pine coming down the Merrimack, right, coming from New Hampshire. Transportation down the Merrimack, fairly straightforward. Uh, lower Merrimack, concentration of shoreside industries specializing in boat building, rope walk, sail making, all of those types of things. And obviously skilled craftsmen. Who are these skilled craftsmen? We've got to talk more about that here. And then from there, it goes to places where they have other strategically differentiating uh, characteristics. For instance, uh, people who've actually gone out in the whale ships, et cetera, and uh, captain and crewed. Now, here is some really cool stuff. I'm not going to go through every one of these, but these are Newbury, Newbury port vessels used at some time in their life that we've been able to determine in whaling. Now, there's the Milo. Do you remember that sketch of the Milo that I showed you earlier? 1811. Look at this. During the Civil War, she was captured in the Bering Sea, which is way the heck up there, by the Shenandoah. She was bonded. There were a couple of other vessels which were set on fire by the Shenandoah. She was bonded, and the crew went back to San Francisco. The Raja lost in the uh, how do you pronounce that? Aksha? But that's off Vladivostok. So, and, and this is 58. So that's before Russia has sold Alaska. It's before Transcontinental Railroad. Stonefleet. See, it says Stonefleet sunk in 62 at Charleston Harbor. There are a couple of, there are three, I think. This is where the Union Navy decided it would be a great idea to block the Confederates in in Charleston. And, of course, the merchants here who had these really old vessels which were leaky and rotted at this point. And, but you know what? They took the government money, and a bunch of vessels went down to Charleston, and they were deliberately scuppered in Charleston Harbor, uh, and it, it didn't work. Uh, but um, <laughs> that's where a lot of the vessels went. Sold in Honolulu, the Bowditch. Great names. Oh, here's the Merrimack. It was eventually condemned in Honolulu in 58. Why Honolulu, right? The captains and the owners said, we don't want you to bring your vessels into uh, San Francisco. Why? Because everybody jumps ship and they become a 49er. There's a massive capital loss. <laughs> and, and you go there now, and th that's a fact. It said, do not bring your vessels to San Francisco. Uh, that's why you see Hawaii. It's why in Lahaina, with the fire there last year, one of the great tragedies in Lahaina was the whaling. Uh, as a matter of fact, the reason why there's a Portuguese community in Lahaina is because guess who was on these whaling vessels then? It was a lot of Portuguese Cape Verdean. Uh, here's the Merrimack, uh, a very typical voyage, leaves, uh, goes to Cape Verde, or uh, probably the Azores first, right? You go around, you pick up the trade winds, you get, very often the crews would leave with light crews. You can easily get to the Azores, and the crew there is a lot cheaper to pay than you'd have if you had to do it in the States. So very often they would go with light crews, go to Cape Verde, <coughs> in this case around Africa, and then you're coming through the um, Indian Ocean here, over through New Zealand, there's a lot of activity. And by the way, beautiful rendering here at the bottom. I just think this is fantastic. It was beautifully done by Jeff. Okay, this is a little complicated. Light blue, the days when none of the five species of whales were seen. Then you have days with more sperm whale. Then you've got right whales that are sighted or caught, so on and so forth. But here's the point. Early on, you've got smaller vessels. You don't have as many vessels. 
and you're kind of going, you know, mostly in the Atlantic area, right? A little bit down here by Pertinabuku, and maybe up to Valparaiso. And then by 1820s, you're getting out to Hawaii for the first time. Here you're all over the world because all the light blues are, are when whales weren't sighted. Look at this curious line. Melville talks about this in Moby Dick. He talks about the line. These are sperm whales that are caught here. These would be South Pacific right whales, sperm whale. This is bowhead whale. The bowhead whale has got a lot of baleen. You can see them hunting off Fremantle, off Australia, off New Zealand. And then it all but peters out by the time you're getting into 1875. Uh, this is a compilation of all the above. Uh, by the way, massive decimation of the gray whale in Baja. That's where the gray whale went to uh, mate, and uh, they found that out, and they were able to slaughter the gray whale. Now I want to talk about one of the most important vessels in American maritime history, and it's the Essex. So built here, we've already noted that a uh, previous vessel was captained by Pollard Sr., and the Essex was uh, stowed by a whale in, in the Pacific um, after they went to the Galapagos. There were 20 sailors on board. It was abandoned, three whaleboats. Uh, what crew went, uh, they were terrified to go west because of reports of cannibalism in the closer islands, and so they decided to come 2,000 miles east. Three months later, Five were emaciated sailors were rescued, three were on a deserted island, and they um, resorted to cannibalism. This is a drawing by Nicholson, which is in Nantucket, and it's the ship Essex with the sperm whale attacking it. This is the raft of the Medusa, just to put this in context. Again, cannibalism. This is not unusual at sea. There's actually law around this. It happened actually in the Andes with a rugby team. A plane crashed there and they resorted to cannibalism. But this is the Raft of the Medusa by Jericho. This was an inspiration for Melville, Mocha Dick, but it was a white whale that was uh, off South America, off Peru. This is the inside page of a very rare book. There are six of these books where, which are known to exist in the world today, written by Owen Chase. Uh, it says, of the most extraordinary and distressing shipwreck of the whale ship Essex of Nantucket, which was attacked and finally destroyed by a large spermaceti whale in the Pacific Ocean, with an account of the unparalleled suffering of the captain and crew by Owen Chase in 1821. So just bear with me for a moment. I'm just gonna read this quip, because it's, it's really good. This is Owen Chase. I observed a very large spermaceti whale, as well as I could judge, about 85 feet in length. It broke water about 20 rods off our weather bow and was lying quietly, with his head in the direction of the ship. It spouted two or three times and then disappeared. In less than two or three seconds, he came up again about the length of the ship off and made directly for us at the rate of three knots. The ship was then going about the same velocity. His appearance and attitude gave us at first no alarm, but while I stood watching his movements and observing him, but a ship slammed off, coming down as us with great celerity. I involuntarily ordered the boy at the helm to put it hard up, intending to steer him and avoid him. And avoid him. The words were scarcely out of my mouth before he had come down upon us with full speed and struck the ship with his head, just forward of the fore chains. He gave us such an appalling and tremendous jar as nearly threw us all in our faces. The ship brought up as suddenly and violently as it being struck a rock and tumbled for a few seconds like a leaf. We looked at each other with perfect amazement, deprived most of the power of speech. Many minutes elapsed before we were able to realize the dreadful accident during which time he passed under the ship, grazing her keel as he went along, come up alongside of her to leeward, and lay on top of the water, apparently stunned with the violence of the blow for a space of a minute. He then suddenly started off in the direction leeward. After a moment's reflection and recovering, in some small measure from the sudden consternation that had seized us, I, of course, concluded that he had stove a hole in the ship and that it would be necessary to set the pumps going. Accordingly, they were rigged, but had not been in operation more than a minute before I perceived the head of the ship to be gradually settling down in the water. 
I then ordered the signal to be set for the other boats which scarcely I had dispatched before I again discovered the whale, apparently in convulsions on top of the water about 100 rods to leeward. He was enveloped in the foam of the sea and his continual and violent thrashing about on the water had created around him. And I could distinctly see him smite his jaws together as if distracted with rage and fury. By this time, the ship has settled down a considerable distance in the water and I gave her up for lost. That is written by Owen Chase right after. That's his first hand account of the whale ship Essex and now for the big reveal. So a friend uh, heard I was going to give this talk. I've known him for the better part of 15 years or so. Uh, and he says, I've got something that your audience might like to see. So I mentioned that there were six of these books in the world today. And that is a copy. And that is one of the six of Owen Chase's original. So you're welcome to look at this afterwards. And it's behind glass because I don't want your paws getting anywhere near this. <laughs> My friend also gave me over here, you may know Rockwell Kent and a great illustrationist, 1930s or so. And he wrote three volumes, and these are the original Rockwell Kent uh, books, and I opened them up to a couple of pages. You'll recognize these drawings here, and uh, I'm very grateful for this person for supporting us. Okay, I'm gonna speed through some of these, and I think I may just leave 20th century whaling till later. Uh, so with um, any business, there's boom and bust, wars are never good, Civil War was particularly bad, uh, Bethany, thanks. I lifted this right off your website. This is the fire that took place in 1811. Uh, never good for, for business. This is uh, a donation from the Institute of Savings. And this is Brig General Worth offering to bring people around a horn. And then, of course, as these vessels went from brigs and schooners into much heavier vessels, the sandbar, just like the sandbar in Nantucket for that matter, caused a great deal of consternation if you're and today if you're trying to get vessels in and out. I put this slide in. It's from Vanity Fair, 1861. Isn't it awesome? <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is Drake's oil well in Titusville. This is where they figured out how to capture oil that I talked about earlier. And grand ball given by the whales in honor of discovery of oil wells in Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> this is San Francisco. So when they decided they didn't need oil because they had figured out cheaper, safer ways to get it on land, well, the poor bowhead whale up in that Sea of Oshkosh or whatever, unlike the baleen that Bill showed you earlier, which is from the North Atlantic right whale or the humpback, that baleen is quite short, the bowhead the baleen could be, well, there's a chap, and that's the size of the baleen in a bowhead whale. And this was in high demand. As a matter of fact, it completely flipped. Prior, you would capture the whale, cut the head off, let that go, other than the mandible and the teeth and the like. You wanted the blubber and the body. Now, you cut the head off, you don't need the oil, that's too hard, it's not selling for a whole lot of money, not worth the effort. You just want the head. And then there was a devastating shock to the whale oil business in 71 when 33 of the vessels, uh, there were one or two from Newburyport that got caught up here. A front moved in. They weren't expecting it. And there was massive capital loss as a result. Uh, National Park Service discovered one of these vessels about 10 years ago. I have to show you one other slide. Hold on. Oh, only because this is one of the coolest items. OK, see this? Check that out. This is just the sweetest thing. That is seal skin. You use saliva to clean it. <laughs> uh, and that's a Ninuit in Inupiat. And that is probably caribou bone or whale bone for the harpoon. And this is from 1850. And this came to us as 
part of a gift from Moon. So this is absolutely gorgeous. I just think it's amazing. <laughs> I'll end with this. If you guys don't ask me any questions, <laughs> there's ivory and ivory, and this is obviously a whale tusk. And this came here about 20 years after Commodore Perry opened up Japan in 55. And it's beautifully carved, probably for the souvenir business, but it's amazing to have it here and uh, a, a great example. All right, are we good? Are we good? I need a whiskey. <laughs>